Underdog Fantasy is the fastest growing fantasy app and easiest place to play fantasy sports. Just jump on underdogfantasy.com or download the app, draft your team, and that's it. And if drafts aren't your thing, they also have a pick'em game where you can win 20 times your money in a single night. Use promo code RADIO and Underdog will double your first deposit when you sign up with up to $100 in bonus cash. Deposit $100? Get $100 free. That's promo code RADIO. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here on the Maroon Friday edition of The Yard. It is, it's been one of those w- weeks, man, for me. It's like every time I turn around, I think, okay, tomorrow will be a little less intensive, and it hasn't been. It's like every day this week, I've had a million things to do. It's been a busy day today. Got up, had to bring one car to the shop, pick one up, and then I, then I spent some time at the uh, Mississippi State Library. Had set up an appointment to uh, research an article that I'm going to be writing on Sunday. Uh, I will be on the road Saturday. I'll be at Lemuria Books at 1.30 signing books, and they carry all five of my books. So if you want to come by and kind of complete your collection or get a Father's Day gift, get a personalized copy, you can do that. And if you wanted to order one, the website is now operational again. Finally got that taken care of. But uh, it's been one of those days. It's like, okay, I've, all I've got to do is record the show and write one article, and I get up and I look, and, you know, life happens, Right. Life happens. This is like, okay, well, this is going to be a smooth day. I'll be able to spend the whole day watching college baseball. And then, nope, life has other plans. So that's where we are. Happy to be on this side of the grass. Hope you guys are as well. Hope it is a payday for you. It is a Friday for you biweekly and perhaps weekly wage earners. Should be a chance for you to get out and go do some things. Wonderful weather we're having these days in Starkville. Had some bad weather yesterday. Even lost power for a little while. But uh, seems to be okay now. Uh, not great weather in some other parts of the country as some of these baseball regionals are being you know, postponed and schedules being altered. And so you know, we hope we can get those games in. But um, it's all very challenging for everybody involved. Uh, we're going to take some time now to congratulate R.J. Yeager. R.J. Yeager, Mississippi State Bulldog, of course. He was uh, first team All-SEC. He was a uh, Ferris Trophy finalist. Now collegiate baseball has named him a third team All-American. Great year for RJ, right? And uh, you know, I'm sure he'll be drafted likely in the top ten rounds, and they'll use the super senior discount on him and pay him because he has no leverage. Pay him peanuts, and then uh, use that money allotted for that spot in the collective bargaining agreement to overpay somebody else. I mean, that's just kind of how it works. But uh, nevertheless, man, RJ Yeager, a great year here at Mississippi State. You know, our last two transfers have come in. Uh, on the infield, they've had really big years, really big years, and and that and that's great too. That's a, that's another opportunity for Chris Lamontis and Jay Gotro and Scott Foxall and Kyle Cheeseburg to say, hey, listen, hey, you come here, look at what's happened to our last couple of guys on the infield. You know, Jess Davis, of course, kind of hit or miss, but um, yeah. You know, my point being is that there are guys that have come here that have had good careers, and then had something monumental happen. When they came here to Mississippi State, that's a really cool thing. And so, uh, let's kind of run it up here. It's uh, it's always interesting, you know, to see how other people view our players. But uh, here's the release: Mississippi State second baseman R.J. Yeager has earned third team All American honors by Collegiate Baseball. It was announced by that publication on Thursday. Yeager is one of ten SEC players to earn All American honors by Collegiate Baseball, and the only second baseman in the league to earn a spot on the teams. Yeager led the Diamond Dogs this season with a 317 batting average and finished sixth in the SEC with 18 home runs, while his 56 RBIs ranked seventh in the league. The graduate from Lynn Haven, Florida, also ranked seventh in the SEC with a 668 slugging percentage, recorded 15 doubles, one triple, and three stolen bases during his lone season in Starkville. Yeager transferred to State after spending four years at Mercer and led Mississippi State this season in batting average, slugging percentage, hits, RBIs, doubles, and home runs. He also paced the Diamond Dogs with team best 21 multi-hit games and tied for first on the squad with 13 multi-RBI games. So congratulations to RJ. And, and some other congratulations are in order, too. RJ is going to get married soon. So congratulations to him and uh, his lovely bride. We wish them the absolute best. So RJ will graduate, get married as an All-American, be drafted, and then head off to a rookie ball somewhere. You know, so it's a pretty busy stretch. Life comes at you fast, RJ. Next thing you know it, man, you're buying welcome mats and playing, you know, car notes on a minivan. You wonder what happened. 
It happens to you. But again, congratulations to him. And, uh, you know, we have had, you know, a slew of All-Americans over the years. And uh, if I told you at the beginning of the year, R.J. Yeager is going to be an All-American for us this year, you would think we're probably back in Omaha. Funny how life works. Funny how life works. But again, congratulations to R.J. Another... Uh, Another reason to update the decals at Duty Noble Field. We have a new, we had a new Major League Baseball player in, our, in Ethan Small, and now another All American. And and I hope that we have to do that every year. You just have to update it every single year. You'd like to be able to update the regional numbers too every single year. Doesn't always work out that way, but the reality of it is is that uh, RJ, despite the fact that. Uh, you know, his team didn't always come true, come through for him. R.J., big year for Mississippi State. And it's difficult, guys. It is difficult to make an All-American list from a last-place team. It really speaks to uh, the kind of year that he had and the kind of player that he is. So, again, congratulations uh, to R.J. and his family. So, we're going to go ahead and name R.J. Yeager. It's the Prime Shrimp Player of the Day. Pretty easy to do, right? I'm not playing a game, and R.J.'s an All-American. Go to primeshrimp.com today. You'll be glad you did. And you can have fresh shrimp shipped directly to your home. Without all the fuss and the prep that goes along with store-bought shrimp, in 10 minutes or so, you can have French Quarter quality prime shrimp on your plate. You don't have to devein them. You don't have to peel them. So there's not all this cleanup and there's not all these problems. But, you know, sometimes, oh, I forgot the shrimp. I forgot the shrimp peels in the trash. Now the whole house smells awful. You just don't have to worry about that. Four great flavors to choose from. You'd be glad you did. Go to primeshrimp.com today and use promo code Boneyard. And those packages can survive the Mississippi heat. So if you order it and it gets delivered in the morning, you can't make it home to the evening, no need to fret. They've got you taken care of. These guys, uh, shrimp, this primeshrimp.com operation will shrimp, will sip, ship shrimp. Say that 10 times real fast. Just about anywhere. And again, use promo code Boneyard to save some money on your order. Again, R.J. Yeager, great guy, great year, great season, wishing him the absolute best. And uh, again, when when you see him him get drafted, and then you, all of a sudden, like the casual fans that don't follow the draft really well, when he signs his contract and you see what his signing bonus is, you're going to just, just drop your jaw like, what? Well, he has no leverage. You know, so it's basically the team can be like take it or leave it. You know, we're gonna we're gonna give you a ten thousand dollar signing bonus, and we're gonna take that extra money and pay somebody else. That's just how the the CBA works. So be prepared for that. Now, if you're a junior, obviously they have to pay a little bit more because you have leverage. You could always go back to school, but it's what they call the super senior saver. And they give those guys absolutely peanuts. So just be prepared for that. You'll see RJ probably go into top ten rounds. And then when you see a signing bonus, you can be like, what? Yeah, just remember, that, that's just how things work. It's just kind of how it all is set up. And uh, don't think R.J. didn't help himself by coming to Mississippi State. I mean, he's an All-American now and obviously put some huge numbers together. Uh, so, you know, his age is a bit of a factor, I guess you could say, but also, too, you know, this is a guy, too, that's kind of proven he can do it at a higher level. His SEC splits are pretty ridiculous. So, again, congratulations to R.J. Just thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company. I love Bulldog Burger Company. I loved them before they loved me. I continue to love them. I eat there regularly. It's part of a great family of restaurants that have served the Golden Triangle for many, many years. These people know what they're doing. They know how to feed folks. And I like getting fed. You do too. Go to Bulldog Burger Company today. Three great locations to serve you. University Drive here in Start Vegas. Gloucester Street there in Tupelo. In the Lake Harbor Drive there in the Ridge and Flowood area. Have the spring rolls as your appetizer. They will make you better looking. Trust the science on that. You'll eat them and you, you get in the car and you get ready to go. You're like, well, wait a minute. Kind of scare yourself a little bit. You might recognize yourself in a review mirror. Get a great restaurant quality hamburger. It's one of the few delicacies in life we can afford ourselves. And you know, here's the thing, too. You say, well, Steve, you know, I'm trying to eat you pretty clean. Well, you can. You can. You can get it on a gluten-free bun. You can get it on a bed of lettuce. You don't have to have it just as it comes. They've got several options for you when you get ready to, to, to order that hamburger. So you can have the enjoy the great quality Bulldog Burger experience and still eat pretty clean. You can also get that BLT salad. I prefer it grilled. You may like it fried. I won't judge you. It's okay. 
sometimes that I feel fried too. So you've got a lot of options to choose from. And again, that Nashville hot chicken sandwich, that's, that's one of those new additions I think is going to be a really big fan favorite. I think you guys are really going to enjoy that. If you haven't tried that, I know sometimes like I know what I'm going to get. Steve, every time I go there, I get the mission. You know what? I can't knock it. But when you're thinking, you know what, I'm going to change it up a little bit, give that Nashville hot chicken sandwich a try. You'll be glad you did. Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet. M-E-A-T. All right, the SEC medians, medians. Meetings will wrap up today if they haven't already. I'm sure people are ready to get out there and enjoy some time with their families. But uh, an important week. And some weeks it's just a chance for everybody to get together and kind of let their hair down a little bit and do a little bit of business. It's been a much different deal this time. You know, the scheduling format is a big part of it. And basically what we've heard from Greg Sankey in recent days is that the divisions are done. Divisions are done in the SEC because of the new scheduling format. And basically we're trying to decide, is it an eight league schedule? Is it an eight game league schedule or nine? There are a lot of people pushing for nine. Others pushing for eight. I don't know for sure, but I would suspect – If you're Mississippi State, Arkansas, Ole Miss, and others, you're pushing for the eight. That way you get the four non-conference games. and You're able to uh, make a little more money at the turnstile, but also, too, achieve bowl eligibility. That's a thing that I think sometimes that uh, people are thinking, oh, well, you know, I want to be entertained, so let's see nine SEC games. I don't think that really helps the TV contract as much as people suspect because what happens on the back end when all of a sudden you don't have – as many teams reaching bowl eligibility. Now, all of a sudden, the bowl package, the bowl purse is less. So, you know, if it's six one way, half a dozen the other, then let's stick with eight. That's what makes sense to me. And I know there are a lot of people out there that are in favor of a nine-game schedule, and we don't get to vote. We don't. But it's part of the deal. As we kind of move forward, we're going to talk some more football a little bit later in the show, too. Start kind of previewing college football season. And then as we get a little bit closer, we get through – uh you know, the dog days of summer, we'll start previewing Mississippi State's opponents. And we're going to get into college football season in earnest here. But the there's not going to be any major decisions about NIL this week. Basically, this has kind of been a think tank of sorts. So everybody gets together and kind of shares their feelings on it, and then the league office will kind of take that feedback and begin to kind of formulate a plan that will be approved by the university presidents. The university presidents met on Thursday, and they actually approved uh, some scheduling changes, I guess you could say, in other sports. We're going to stick with 18 conference games in, in men's basketball. Some other things kind of moved around a little bit. Nothing major in that respect, but you know, you're getting some things kind of handled as we kind of move forward, kind of the business of the SEC. And it's really a chance to kind of get everybody together when school is out. And things aren't quite so labor intensive. But uh, there's a lot going on, uh, to say the least. You know, there's all this talk about the transfer portal. And I think one of the big things that is important to kind of think about, and we've touched on it in earlier shows, is will this scholarship modeling pass this summer? And again, there's a lot of talk that it will. And there are a lot of schools out there that are not really excited about college baseball. But what this is going to do is it is going to enable you to fully fund certain sports provided you you remain Title IX compliant. That's the big issue there. And there are a lot of people out there, too, and I've I've read some articles in recent days that uh, don't jive with what I've heard about Title IX. I mean, the way that I have always – it's an equal number of opportunities. And it's not based on really anything other than that. You you can't discriminate when it comes to financial aid – on the basis of gender. And so for you know same numbers of scholarships that are available for men, you got to make it available for women, as it should be. I've shared with you guys before, I suspect what State will do is probably fully fund softball or soccer and probably some women's track stuff. But it all boils down to what the squad size is going to look like. But let's say for an example, you know, South Dakota State, people like that, they don't play college baseball the way we do. They would probably want to fully fund hockey. And so – You're going to see, I believe, if this measure passes, and I believe it absolutely will, you're going to see greater division in college baseball. 
And this weekend, there's going to be a lot of parity. You, you may even have a four win a ball game. You know, there's going to be some things happen. Everybody's got an ace, right? But when all of a sudden I can offer twice the number of scholarships than your school can offer, you would think that the caliber of players available to me on my roster would be greater. Does that mean that college baseball is going to break away? I think what's going to happen is this is the first big step towards creating divisions in college baseball. Bulldog fans, if you drive around this great country, you'll see that there is uh, still very much a shortage of quality employees. America's workforce is not back to its full capacity. Not exactly sure for all the reasons, but uh, bottom line is some of my favorite businesses having a reduction in staff, a reduction in hours, and in some cases a reduction in services because they can't find quality applicants. Maybe you're in that situation. Let me recommend our friends at Indeed. It's I-N-D-E-E-D.com. Indeed, a hiring partner that can help you find the applicants that best fit your unique skill set. A lot of people out there having to hire people perhaps that uh, aren't the most qualified or perhaps aren't prepared for that job just to have somebody. You know, go to this screening process with Indeed by using this Instant Match program. One of the best things about that Instant Match program is you get the people that best qualify for your job. And there's some incentive for that too. Go to Indeed.com slash Boneyard, and because you're a Boneyard listener, they're going to give you 75 bucks off. They'll give you a credit right there out of the gate. And you only pay for the applicants and the resumes that you use. Use it today. Get your business back to full staff and capacity at Indeed.com slash Boneyard. There are a lot of causes in life to celebrate. Birthdays, weddings, in some cases funerals, graduations, bar mitzvahs, Amerigo Vespucci Day. That's right. Look it up yourself. The discoverer of our great nation. And some, sometimes maybe you don't need a good cause to celebrate. Sometimes you just want a nice evening in with friends. Maybe you're like, you know, the weather's bad, or I just don't want to get out again now that I've gotten home. Contact our friends at Drizzly. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y.com. Or download the Drizzly app today. And new customers, if you use promo code SPRING5, that's S-P-R-I-N-G, and the number five, you get five bucks off your first order. Whether you're looking for beer, wine, spirits, you can have it delivered sometimes in less than 60 minutes. There are a lot of people out there today that say, you know what, Steve, I just don't feel like getting out. I don't want to go out and kind of the hustle and bustle, but I would like to have a nice drink. I'd like to be able to have a chance to relax with friends and family. Let Drizzly.com be your partner in that endeavor. And listen, I love it when, you know, Coppin State makes it. I think it's a cute story. They're never going to get to Omaha. You guys know my feelings about that. I think we need multiple divisions. That's not to say you don't play them, but you have a different championship. Just like we do with football. you got FBS and FCS. You play an FCS team once a year. Maybe there will be some scheduling limitations or whatever that you put on that. Just somebody that can load up their schedule with FCS. I'm sure Notre Dame will try to do that. Um, but my point being is that in order to really grow the sport of baseball and allow those universities – that are truly committed to college baseball, is you, you can't let those that aren't pull them back. I've said on the show before, Monmouth has the same vote that Mississippi State does. Miami of Ohio has the same vote that OSU does. Is that fair? I submit to you it's not. It's not because we're not mutually aligned in our investment when it comes to college baseball. So we have elected to have these divisions in football. Why is it so far removed to think we couldn't do it in baseball? You know, FCS, is the the scholarship limits are 65. And so in baseball, we can just say, hey, hey, you want to discontinue to do 11.7? And you don't don't have to use 11.7. But if you want to continue that model, then you're going to be an FCS baseball team. The FBS, of course, stands for football, ball, subdivision. We have the different names. But the reality of it is, is that the teams that truly want to grow the game, that really want to invest in college baseball, are being held back by those who don't. Do you really think anybody in the North wants to help the conferences in the South? It's like, hey, you know, Michigan played for a NAFL championship here a couple years ago, but that's kind of an anomaly. You look at the fact that the SEC and the ACC got 
nine teams apiece in this year's NCAA college baseball tournament. That's 18 out of 64 teams in two conferences. You throw in what the Big 12 did, it's like it's over half the field. The Big 10, most years, is a one to two bid league. And a lot of that is because people don't want to play baseball up there. Because it's difficult to play baseball up there. I mean, you spend the first month of the season on the road because of weather. I've often wondered, too, like if I was in Minnesota Golden Gophers, if I wouldn't work out a deal. Work out a deal with the Twins. Right? You better play indoors. You better play all kinds of games up there. You could advance your program. I don't know what, how, what that looks like financially. But it's difficult for a lot of other you know, programs that are not in major cities or have access to indoor facilities. You think anybody out there at Ohio State is thinking, hey, you know what? These guys at Mississippi State and Arkansas and Ole Miss, they've got some really good ideas about advancing the game. Well, let's let them do it. It's like the reason that the, the third assistant paid the volunteer assistant that measure didn't pass last year is not because anybody was being mean-spirited. But it's one of those things, was how does it help us? We can't afford to pay a third assistant coach. And so if we enable the SEC and the ACC to do it, then all of a sudden, you know, our pool of candidates when we get ready to go hire another assistant coach is diminished. So there, it's, it's a self-survival type thing. Everybody's looking out for themselves. But nobody feels sorry for Mississippi State or the SEC or the ACC. And, you know, you got, you know, you got the Ivy League that is part of this. You think the Ivy League is ever going to do anything to help anybody else? I mean, you, you play those teams, and it's very rare that you ever see one of those teams make it and really compete. And as I've said with you guys before, it's just like, you know, my friend Juan got it, played at Southern. They, they went and they were a four that beat a one at Cal State Fortin. But that was the – that's the moment. They knew before they got on the bus to get into, to drive to the airport in Baton Rouge to get on the plane and go to Cal State Fort, and they had no chance of winning. So why not give those programs a chance to win something? And I, listen, I don't believe in participation trophies either. But if this enables us to advance the top half of the college baseball programs nationally, it's worth it to me. I mean, let, let these guys get together and they can play in Kansas City or whatever and Call it a day. You know, and give them something. You talk about advancing the game. What what if the folks at Campbell University had an opportunity to play for a world championship? You said, but Steve, they, they were in the regional final last year. Yeah, but let's be honest about it. What are the, what are the real, maybe the realistic options for Campbell University to make it to Omaha? And well, Coastal Carolina did it. But, I mean, the reason we remember that is because that's the anomaly. That's the exception rather than a rule. And so I believe this scholarship program, if passed, will bring not just meaningful change this year, but meaningful change in the subsequent years as people begin to see the kind of how this all kind of shakes loose. You know, if you're Mississippi State, it's like, hey, well, now, all of a sudden, we'll, we'll just pay 100% to everybody, and we can, and it's real money, right? I mean, it's real money. It's got to be funded somehow, right? But wouldn't you guys be willing to pay a little extra to get your season tickets, knowing that it's, you're going to fully fund baseball at Mississippi State? I suspect most would. If your general admission ticket went up a dollar, would you, would you really care that much? Oh, well, that money's being used to fully fund scholarships for baseball and, in turn, women's sports as well. You absolutely would. It's real money, but there's a way to get it done. And John Cohen's a great steward of our money, and I don't mean that he just simply hoards it. That was one of the criticisms of Larry Templeton. Well, Larry won't spend anything. Larry keeps you know keeps us in the black, but he won't really spend anything. You know, John spends. And so you can rest assured – that the former baseball coach and the current AD already has a plan in place of how to execute all this stuff. I think it's important for everybody to kind of see what happens next because what the NCAA is going to do if the program passes is the NCAA is not going to say, okay, full scholarships for everybody in baseball. They're kicking, thing down, kicking it all down to the individual leagues. 
Well, you know the SEC will elect, okay, we're going to fully fund baseball. And maybe instead of having 11.7, you know, maybe we have 25 scholarships. Maybe we have 20 scholarships. We don't know yet. We don't know how many we're going to have to work with. But you better believe that nobody's going to have more than the SEC. And so if the leagues themselves can then decide, okay, this is what we're going to do, then you can kind of begin to put some plans in place also to make sure you're Title IX compliant. And that, that's – there is no – there's no wiggle room with that, nor should there be. But kind of understand when, when this thing kind of rolls out in August, that doesn't mean that everybody that plays baseball at Mississippi State is going to be able to get a full scholarship. That's not what it means. And until we know what the squad size is and how many scholarships that they're willing to have, and, and, of course, you can split them up, and you've got some guys, too, that have academic aid, so you can stack that on top of the academic aid. Let's say you've got a, you know, a, a, a player like uh, you know, Drew McGowan's a guy that's, extremely intelligent guy let's say drew's got an athletic scholarship and an academic scholarship well you know we can stack that aid together and he maybe he only needs a partial athletic scholarship to kind of make sure that he can graduate debt free well then that money can be utilized somewhere else and so you're just simply going to have more money to work with you know and i guess we could be absolutely shocked when they come back and say you know what we're going to pay scholarships to everybody you know we're going to use our collective to fund these scholarships or whatever you know I think that's the, that's probably a good use of the collective, right? You know, we talk about improper benefits and things like that. Well, let's say we're going to use the collective to fund scholarships for non-revenue producing sports on most college campuses. Well, who, who would be upset about that? If it's allowable and say, you know what, hey, we're going to just put together this great collective and everybody's going to donate to it. Nobody's going to have any contact with the kids themselves. We'll just kind of fund this through the athletic department. It's not going to be part of the recruiting process, whereas, okay, we're going to give you $75,000 to come, right? We're just going to make sure you graduate debt-free. That's a cool thing. It's a cool benefit. So, again, we'll see kind of how that kind of moves forward. But um, a lot to kind of think about. So, paying attention to this. And, again, when it comes to football, divisions are going to go away. Nobody has officially said that, but based on some of Greg Sankey's comments, you kind of get there. It's going to go to a one-divisional format. And I think that's a good thing in some respects because how many years – it's kind of like Vandy in baseball, right? You know, how many years is it with just kind of Florida and Georgia over there in the east, and they get the benefit of playing, you know, Vanderbilt and, and Kentucky and South Carolina every year, and then we have to play Alabama, Auburn, LSU every year, right? So now all of a sudden you can maybe avoid that murderer's row a little bit because the SEC West is absolutely loaded in football. Everybody knows it. And so if we do away with the divisions and all of a sudden you have either the one and seven, so one permanent opponent, and then seven rotating, of course ours would be Ole Miss. And I don't think Ole Miss would be upset about that. I don't think Ole Miss deep down wants to play LSU every year. I don't care what they say. I don't think they do. And I think that's probably better for their program is not having to play LSU every year. Now you're going to have to play somebody, but having to play LSU every year, that's tough. And listen, I know Ole Miss has won some games up there, but you know they should be supportive of the one-seven format. The three-six format is interesting too, and again, it's basically the pods. I know there's all the pods just going away. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. You're just riding it a different way. It was going to be four fourteen pods where you played everybody in your pod every year, and then they rotated. The rest. it was the same thing. So you're going to have three permanent opponents. Okay, so basically this is my pod. We're not calling them pods. It's it, guys, the same thing. And so the reality of it is this, is so if you're, like, if you're Alabama, and we know that they will be the, they'll be catered to, and Alabama wants to continue to play, you know, Tennessee, which I, I'm sure they're happy with it. I mean, Tennessee can't beat them. Then they can play Auburn and then pick up one more. And, again, I think that's probably LSU. So Alabama gets LSU, Tennessee, and Auburn, and then Auburn can continue to play Georgia. And then they, they pick up somebody else too. You know, and so you get to those annual rivalry games every year. But I don't think we're going to play Alabama every year. I think the elimination of divisions and the establishment of a new schedule rotation, I think we'll avoid Alabama every other year. That'd be a relief compared to what we've endured, right? If memory serves me correct, we played Alabama more than anybody in our history. I think that's right. It's time for us to get a break. And so it'll be interesting to see how those three kind of work together. I mean, you look at, you know, it makes perfect sense to me if you're Texas. 
you know, they're going to fill the stadium anyway. But if you're, if you're trying to sell TV numbers, you got to get Texas OU. You got to get Texas, Texas A&M. And then does Texas get somebody from the East? Do you, you maintain a permanent East opponent as well? I mean, I could get down with that, right? I mean, you get your natural rival and then maybe one from the West and one from the East. You know, I think you could make that work. Come at us, Missouri, right? Or maybe even Kentucky. I'm okay with that. You know, does Ole Miss get to keep Vanderbilt? I mean, it's like there's a lot of options here, and no firm decisions have been made yet. But I think, you know, things are going to change, and maybe that's for the betterment of Mississippi State. I think not having to play, you know, Alabama, LSU, Auburn, A&M every single year is a benefit to us. So I'm eager to see what they come up with. The, the latest report was they don't think they'll have an answer today. They could. They don't think so. But they could. And as they continue to work through the NIL legislation and all that kind of stuff. And, I, and I'll, I'll tell you, it's so silly, too. People focus on such minor things. Like I saw all these articles about the seating chart. Who cares? What does that mean? Do you think Nick Saban and Jimbo Fisher are going to fight? They're going to throw spitballs at each other? Come on. These guys are professionals. I know they had a momentary lapse of reason, and both of them uh, got reprimanded by the league as well as they should. But who, who cares about the seating chart? It's stupid. Let's focus on what matters most, what, what, how, this, how the changing world of college athletics is impacting the Southeastern Conference. That's what matters most. All right, let's thank our friends at um, Close to Blair. Blair Chandler, mortgage professional, longtime friend of mine, I'm a big fan of his, too. Guy's a great guy. Does a great job. And here's one of those things, too. If you're one of these kind of people that is uh, looking to refinance your home, and maybe you haven't even considered that. You know, Steve, I just don't know. One day I'll be done paying for this, and maybe you will. But you know what? You might have to white-knuckle it the whole way there. Maybe get a, a line of credit. Maybe get a second mortgage. Maybe refinance your home and consolidate some debt. Maybe you're looking to buy a home for the first time. Maybe you've been turned down before. Maybe it's time to try again. Blair is a guy that's been in the industry 21 years. He is a mortgage professional. Top 1% close ratio in the country two years in a row. So that's a guy that gets things done. He has seen it all and done it all. Whether you are an atypical borrower, maybe kind of non-conforming with your, your employment or your pay, he can devise a plan for you to help get you a loan done. If you give Blair a call or a text or an email or, you know, ride by and yell at him, whatever, uh, and tell him you heard about him on the boneyard, he's going to pay for your appraisal. So that's some money right out of the gate that you don't have to spend. Blair's phone number is 601-500-2344. Again, 601-500-2344. And that number is directly to him. That's his personal cell number. It's not a receptionist. It's not a voicemail behind, uh, you know, some desk or something. You give him a call or text whenever you want to. And that's the number I call him on, and I don't borrow any money from him. So you can reach him. Again, that's close with Blair, C-L-O-S-E with Blair, B-L-A-I-R.com. Time for today's top ten list. Roy is still on vacation, so if you're looking for the list to pop up on Spotify, probably be a day or so. And speaking of vacation, uh, I'm going to be taking vacation here in a couple weeks, and so the show is going to go on a bit of a hiatus too. And so... What I will likely do is record you guys a couple shows before I go and record when I get back. I just have to kind of look and see how the calendar works. I probably record one maybe on Sunday for the Monday show and then maybe record one on Monday for you guys. That way you'll get two shows that week. But uh, I am going to take vacation. And I am such a workaholic. You know, a lot of times, too, even when I'm on vacation, I'm still working. You know, because, I, number one, I love the work. But I also love my family. And so I want to have an opportunity to kind of spend some time with them and let my mind rest some because it rarely ever does. I'm one of those kind of people, as soon as I wake up in the morning, my mind begins to index, but all things I need to do today. It, it's so helpful to have the notes section on my phone or I can send a text to myself, don't forget to do this, this, and this. And so I'm looking forward to maybe not having anything to do for a while. So I hope you can forgive me. I am going to take a few days off and uh, spend time with my family. I'd prefer to be in Omaha. And that's not a shot at my family. I'm just saying that rather than go somewhere else. I wish we were all getting together in Omaha for the College World Series. But today's top 10 list, top 10 Depeche Mode albums. I didn't even check. I don't think we've done this one. You know, Depeche Mode's one of my favorite bands, and uh, I'm 99% positive we haven't done this one. If we have, you'll have to indulge me. 
So last year, Depeche Mode inducted into Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They're not a rock and roll band, but if they're going to let bands like that in, they needed to let Depeche Mode in. There are a lot, like the Eurythmics have no business going in. I don't, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. They don't belong in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They don't. But uh, Depeche Mode, if you're going to go with synth pop and kind of some alternative music in that direction, Depeche Mode's one of the greatest. 14 studio albums. I believe it's correct. 14 studio albums in their career. So that gives us a cool, crisp uh, 14 to work with. And they've had several live albums, and there's compilation albums, and there's remix albums. I mean, there is no shortage of Depeche Mode material out there for you. I mean, there are tons, tons. And so we're going to stack them up, my top 10 albums from Depeche Mode. And they really broke in in the late 80s, early 90s. You know, I, I was uh, on the bandwagon a little earlier than most in Mississippi, I guess. And then went back and kind of jumped into the back, back channels of the catalog and got to know things a little bit deeper. You know, I, we had MTV in Columbia, Mississippi. It took us a while to get it, but once we got it, that was one of the best things. When I would go stay with my dad, like they, they had MTV before we did in Columbia. And so... I loved it. And then we would, I, I remember the first time we watched it, we were on vacation. It's like I, you couldn't get us out of the room. We had a chance to watch MTV. And so all of a sudden, the new world was opened up to us. Because your local radio stations only play, you know, it, when I was a kid, it was like bluegrass or whatever. You know, we were fortunate we could find a, a station around that played a little rock. Tip of the cap to 106.7 Z-Rock out of Jackson. Thank you guys so much. But uh, it was difficult sometimes to pick it up. And so we had WR in New Orleans, the Rock of New Orleans. Kids today will never understand the struggle we had of trying to listen to some radio station a couple hours away when all of a sudden rainstorms would come in and things like that, and all of a sudden you can't listen, especially when it was like a countdown or something. It was terrible. But because of the fact we had MTV, all of a sudden we got to see these other bands like Depeche Mode. And so I was very enamored with them early on. And then as my musical taste kind of began to change a little bit too, they did too. And I really felt like in some respects, they kind of came in my direction. So here we go. Number 10, the number 10 album for me is uh, one that had one of their first big hits on it. It's Construction Time Again. That was actually their second album, if memory serves me correct. No, it's their third album, Construction Time Again. It came out in 83 and actually went gold. How about that? And it's incredible, too. Like, they had re-released some of their earlier catalog, and then it went gold. Like, when they first released it, it was just kind of just hanging out there a little bit. And then once Construction Time Again came along, people began to go buy up the back the back catalog. Number nine, this is the second album. Oh, I guess our song, I, I, I forgot to do that. Our song from Construction Time Again is Everything Counts. Everything Counts. And this is right when Martin Gore... He was so far ahead of the game. like He was already beginning to sample stuff. Like, I mean, back in those days, like the early generation, Prophet 2000s and things like that, they were kind of noisy samplers. But because Depeche Mode was an established band with all these licensing deals, um, Martin was way ahead of everybody else. And like other people were sampling songs. Martin was like sampling like household things and just other things. Like he would like get a drill and a trash can and then sample that and make that a voice to use i guess he was using a synclavier then but uh, either way they were so far ahead of the game and i think it's why their sound was so different than everybody else everybody else was using stock voices and then here's martin gore kind of tailoring everything to his own genius and this this album really i think kind of showed the first steps of that Okay, the number nine album, A Broken Frame, that's the second album, and uh, Leave in Silence is our song here. Leave in Silence, easily the best song on that album, and uh, it is a very good album. I just don't like it as much as some of the other stuff. I think they were, this was like a, a transformative album for them, because like when Speak and Spell came out, it was like, oh, well, this is rather interesting. And then next thing you know, Martin and Dave are trying to kind of find the direction they want to go. And so I think this was a little bit disjointed, but uh, Leaving Silence is a great one. Number eight, a more recent album. Maybe you're unfamiliar with it. It actually came out in 2001. 
and uh, went platinum in, in a couple countries in gold and just about all the rest. And, and Depeche Mode has a huge following, huge following. Um, but off the album Exciter, I went with Dream On. And one of the things that I like about it is uh, you know, you've got this um, staticky type voice in the beginning and this cool guitar part comes in. And uh, the name of the song is Dream On, not the Aerosmith version. Also kind of a song of empowerment. Number seven, this is going back a little bit too. And this is when this album in many respects is, uh, is aptly named. It became Black Celebration. And it really kind of set up, it was the kind of the bridge between some great reward and music for the masses, not just because of where it appears chronologically in their catalog, but the sound began to get a little darker. Like there were so many more effects that those guys were using. And so it wasn't just the poppy type stuff. Now all of a sudden the sound has really evolved to the point that these guys truly were ready to make a big jump and establish themselves as superstars, not just in the United States, but globally. So Black Celebration, and we're going with the song Stripped, and I absolutely love it. It is one of the best songs in the catalog. It absolutely is. And sometimes I forget about it. You know what I'm saying? It's like sometimes it's like, you oh, I'll listen to the ones, the hits I know, and then all of a sudden I'll stumble across it. I'm like, oh, yes. All right, number six, Speak and Spell. That's a debut album. We're going back a little bit there. Speak and Spell, again, it, it was revolutionary for its time. It came out in 81. And that's an album, too. Like, You Just Can't Get Enough is our song. Um, but, like, when that came out, it was like, it wasn't so cheesy like some of the other stuff that was on the radio at the time. They had three really good singles on here, Dreaming of Me, New Life, but Just Can't Get Enough, to me, is the one that's kind of the, you know, the longer-lasting one. And they were still a little bit, you know, kind of refining their sound and, it's very kind of upbeat and peppy and kind of poppy, but it's different. You know, it's like synth pop was just really beginning to come, and they were kind of a precursor for several other bands. This this album, very inspirational. There are a lot of, uh, you know, lineage you can draw in what other people have done in their careers back to the Speak and Spell album. All right, number five, and I have, I've, I have had some spirited discussions over the years with other Depeche Mode fans that believe this is the best one. This is the best album, and it's some great reward. I don't think it is the best one, which is why I have it number five. I could, I probably could have made an argument to make it number four, and maybe I should have, and I'm sure that I'll get a call from a friend of mine. I think this is some great reward was the first step towards the new sound. So we weren't, all, we weren't going to be quite so poppy, and of course we kind of had figured out the sampling aspect of it and how to work that in where it wasn't quite so forced. And I think you got the most polished sound from Depeche Mode to date on some great reward. Now, this is a, an absolute gem of an album. Master and Servant is a name that people know very well. Uh, Blasphemous Rumors. Believe it or not, that was at one time the working title for the book Flim Flam. I, I, kind of, I was just going to throw an homage the Depeche Mode, I thought it fit. Blasphemous Rumors, you know, when we did the Hugh Freeze uh, stuff. But uh, that's how it looked, Blasphemous Rumors. But our song is People Are People. One of the best songs in the catalog. And I think a lot of people, too, a lot of casual fans kind of got on board once this began to get heavy rotation on MTV. Number four, kind of kicking myself a little bit for having some great award five and ultra number four ultra this is kind of like at the tail end of the heyday right this is like they had put together multiple platinum albums in a row and this this kind of snapped that streak released in 1997 it's the album ultra i dig it um you guys didn't like it nearly as much barrel of a gun i think is great but i went with it's no good and uh, that's the you know that's the one you're you know talking about it you know don't say you want me don't say you need me it's understood don't say you're happy out there without me because it's no good great 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 song and uh, I love this album I, I I liked it more than the critics did and kind of the record buying public so maybe I'm a little partial to it but um, it didn't kind of get the fuel that some earlier stuff got music was changing a little bit too 
Okay, so now we're down to the top three, and I think everybody will agree this is the top three. You may disagree with me on four, and I kind of disagree with me on four due to some great reward probably should be four. Um, again, kind of second-guessing myself. But the top three, and I think number three is going to be a little bit controversial to you, you know, long-time Depeche Mode fans. I think you would probably have a different album here. It's music for the masses for me. Music for the masses is number three on my list. And this is one of those albums, too, that you can just kind of let it go. You just hit play and let it go. If you've got the CD version or the digital version, you can let it go. It's perfect. Never Let Me Down Again is how it opens and the things you said. and you know, it's just There's so many great ones on here and a couple controversial ones, too. Uh, Behind the Wheel is a great one. I Want You Now, very seductive song, but we're going to go with Strange Love. And I love the remix version of this thing, too, and there's so many things out there. Martin Gore, again, is a musical genius, but uh, Strange Love, off music for the masses. Never Let Me Down Again is another one that's really good, but Strange Love, to me, is an iconic song. So if that's not number two, what is? Because I think we all know what number one is. For me, it's Songs of Faith and Devotion. Came out in 1993. I loved it from the first time, but I, the, the, as soon as I held it in my hands, as soon as I saw "I Feel You" on MTV and the album was released, I was at Sound Shop to get it the day of release. Absolutely loved this album. And again, this is one of those albums too. You just let it play, man. You know, there's no skips on this album. To me, one of the most seductive songs in the history of music is on this album. And that's not your single, but I wanted to give it a little praise here. It's In Your Room. And, and that go with the album version, not the radio edit version or even remix version. In Your Room, the percussion on that, absolutely amazing. Again, could have gone with I Feel You, could have gone with uh, The Mercy In You is, is incredible. Get Right With Me is one of those songs too. It's like, it's a deeper track. And I begin to think, you know what, this could have easily been a single. But we're going and walking in my shoes. Walking in My Shoes is your number two song. The number one album, and, you know, we, when I was a teenager, it's like even when U2's Joshua Tree came out, and people were like, you know, this is, this is one of those albums people are going to be talking about forever. And, of course, we had Appetite for Destruction. From the Depeche Mode crowd, they were right there in it, too. And, again, the late 80s, early 90s, what a great time for music. I would submit to you in some respects the late 80s were actually better. That's right, better. We got Violator. The first singles came out in late 89, and then the album released in 1990. Man, I absolutely love this album. Absolutely love this album. Again, you just push play, and you let it go. And there are so many great songs on here. I mean, it, when they first released it, it had nine. They eventually released an expanded edition with some remixes on there. But uh, bottom line, nine. World in My Eyes, great tune, Sweetest Perfection. Love the vocal on that one. Halo is one of my favorites, too. I could go on and on about this. Waiting for the Night, there's a live version on YouTube. You can see when uh, things are really beginning, beginning to settle, like when the sun is going down at the amphitheater. It's incredible. Um, but we're going to go Personal Jesus, which I think that is the iconic Depeche Mode song. So there you go, top 10 Depeche Mode albums and my favorite song from each. And uh, if you are a person, even if you don't like rock, maybe you like it a little bit, and maybe you like Top 40, and you don't like kind of alternative, darker type music, give this a try. This is great driving music. So, Roy, will get the list up, and I think, again, you'll listen to this, and uh, you just see the maturation of the band, the kind of the evolution of their sound. And I, I give a lot of that to Martin Gore. And again, he is an absolute musical genius. So if I was like to write the most unheralded geniuses in music, it's probably Nick Rhodes from Duran Duran and it's Martin Gore from Depeche Mode. There would be no Trent Reznor and Nine Inch Nails without those two guys, period. It wouldn't happen. There would have been no genre for them. There would be no new order without those guys. Those guys set it up for everybody else. There's no question about it. And so I would have to say probably Depeche Mode, like if I had to rank like my favorite bands of all time, Depeche Mode, easily a top five for me, easily a 
a top five. And, again, one of the things I encourage people to do, too, like maybe, well, Steve, I know the hits. Maybe what I would encourage you to do, listen to the hits, kind of get familiar, but you know, maybe put on an album you're not quite as familiar with. You know that the, uh, the quality is going to be there. Maybe you're unfamiliar with the songs. You gift yourself the opportunity to fall in love with some, some new tunes. So there you go. If you have ideas for the top ten list, reach out and let us know. You can find Roy at Twitter at Dogmatic. That's D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C-6-7. Dogmatic67 on Twitter. Send him your ideas, and we'll get back to it uh, all at next week. And uh, thank you guys so much for your support of the top ten list. It's been absolutely outstanding. It's like somebody's list get over 20,000 impressions. It just blows my mind. Uh, there's more people sometimes that look at the list and listen to the show. It's crazy. It's crazy. But again, thank you guys so much for your support of the top ten list. It's always brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. All right, next segment of the show brought to you by Campus Bookmart. Longtime sponsors of this show, longtime contributors to the Mississippi State experience here in Starkville. Great people doing a great job at a great price. Be sure and go check them out in person and see the lovely, talented Susie, Miss Kathy Brown, Miss Pam Minyard, the whole crew up there. They will treat you like family because in their minds you are family. It's as simple as that. So go by, check them out. If you can't make it to town, let me encourage you to visit them on the World Wide Web at campusbookmart.net. And by being a loyal Boneyard listener, we'll give you a phrase that pays. That is BSR. Promo code BSR stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. That gets you free shipping on all orders over 50 bucks. Any order less than 50 bucks, absolutely incomplete. All right, let's talk a little football here. I, I told you we're going to talk some football today. We are. Now, as we get a little closer to the season, we're going to preview all of Mississippi State's opponents. I'm going to go ahead and give you an SEC West preview today. Now, things may change as we get into fall camp, because you, not to mention you may have some other transfers come in. I don't think you'll have anybody of, of significance in the month of July. But um, there is a lot to kind of unpack here. Now, I'm going to start at number seven. Probably the most beleaguered and harried coach in the league right now is Brian Harson. You know, all these rumors and innuendo about his personal life, and there was talk they were going to fire him, and apparently they could not substantiate those allegations. He is still there. That is a very, very, very demanding fan base. They are not happy with the direction of the program, nor should they be. You begin to think about last year. You know, this Auburn football team last year had some chances to do some things and then didn't do it. You know, and I would submit to you that the loss to Mississippi State, probably among the ones that stung the most because of the, the fact that they got the big lead there and then State comes roaring back to win the game. So Auburn ends last year at six and seven. They beat Akron, Alabama State, and that and those combined scores of 122 to 10. And everybody's like, man, look at this offense roll. Kind of made everybody nervous. They lose at Penn State, which that was not a bad loss, but they lose 28 to 20. They beat Georgia State 34-24, and if you recall, Georgia State got absolutely hosed in this ballgame. Georgia State really dominated the game until late. And then Auburn rolls down and then takes a late lead after an incomplete pass is ruled complete, and then they review it and leave it as a completed – it was ridiculous. And then Georgia State, with one last chance, throws a pick six – and so they're three and one, but it was a very, very, very tenuous three and one after that. And you can say, well, maybe they just had a bad game. They bounce back the next week. They go into Tiger Stadium and they beat LSU 24 19. And of course, this is when things really began to unravel for LSU. They see Georgia the next week lose 34 to 10. No shame in that. I mean, Georgia, obviously, one of the better teams in the country. And you think, okay, well, Auburn's just coming middle of the road. They go to Arkansas, and Bo Nix absolutely destroys Arkansas. That was 11 a.m. kick. It was a 38-23 ball game, but really, I thought the best game of the year for Auburn because that's a quality Arkansas team, and you go into their own neck of the woods and beat them. 
they beat Ole Miss the next week, and you're like, hey, well, these guys are going to be okay. You know, what, what are they, at this point, uh, six and two? Yeah, six and two, and you think, all right, well, things are good. They go to A&M and score three points. And then Mississippi State beats them 43-34. You remember how crazy that game was. One of the better games of the year for Mississippi State, Will Rogers. So now they're reeling a little bit. Six and four with a couple of games left to play. You think, okay, they could still finish eight and four. They lose at South Carolina. And I'll be honest with you, as much as I like Shane Beamer, I think last year is a bit of an uh, aberration. I really do. I don't think they're going to get the benefit of uh, sneaking up on people this year. But uh, they, they win the game, 21-17, and then Auburn nearly beats Alabama. You recall Auburn dominated that game for much of the game, and then Alabama comes back late. It's 10 nothing uh, headed to the fourth. And that Auburn defense is playing outstanding. Alabama finds a way late to tie it. We go into overtime. Alabama wins 24-22. And then at that point, from that point forward, everything was negative. Everything was negative. Then they lose the Birmingham Bowl 17-13 to end the year 6-7. and seven. So, again, you're 6-2 and two at the midway point after beating Ole Miss, a, a good Ole Miss team too. And then you, you lose out. And now, most of these games were competitive, obviously. I mean, with the exception of the A&M game, the games were all competitive. But you found a way to lose. That Auburn defense is not what it was. And then they have been absolutely wrecked by the NCAA portal. Wrecked. You know, Bo Nix leaves. It just seems like every time you turn around, somebody from Auburn was leaving. Uh, there is a culture problem at Auburn. In many respects, there always has been. I think this is Brian Harson's last year. And I think they actually take a step back from last year. I think they're 4-8. and eight. I think they win one conference game this year, and that's going to be against Missouri. So they'll get they'll get off to probably a three and one start. They get Penn State in their neck of the woods. It's an important non conference game, but I think they'll beat Mercer and beat San Jose State, lose to Penn State, and beat Missouri, and then they'll be three and one. And everybody thinks, okay, well maybe they're going to be okay. I think LSU gets them. I think they lose at Georgia. I think they lose at Ole Miss. I think they lose against Arkansas. They'll lose at State. They'll lose A&M, and they'll beat Western Kentucky and lose in Bryant-Denny. So I got them 4-8 and eight and 1-7 and seven in the league and 7th in the SEC and then pushing towards a coaching change. I think everybody would probably uh, expect that to be the case if, uh, if they have that type of year. And, uh, again, you've got a coaching staff that's really embattled there, and then you have you know, a roster that has lost a lot of talent. All right, so who is sixth? Well, I'll tell you who's sixth. And this may come as a surprise. I know many of you will be like, well, Steve's just being a homer here. It's Ole Miss. Now, this is going to be a wild year for Ole Miss. And uh, Jeff Levy is gone. And uh, if memory serves me correctly, every assistant coach from Lane Kiffin's first staff is gone with one exception. And that's Derek Nix. That's crazy to think about it, isn't it? Yeah. So they were ten and three last year. They had a veteran team, and I'm you know Matt Corral. What what else can you say? The guy was outstanding last year. And you look at some of these numbers. I mean, it's like you almost think it was a disappointment they didn't win more. But they beat Louisville. They beat Austin P. They beat Tulane. Offense absolutely rolling. They go and play Alabama, and then people are like, "Ole Miss has got a chance." That game was not competitive in the least. They scored some some points late to kind of make it look better than it was. But they lost. It was an emphatic win for Alabama. The next week, they beat Arkansas 52-51. And you recall, that's when uh, Arkansas went for two and then uh, just couldn't make a play there. And so Ole Miss wins a wild one. Then they go to Tennessee. That's the mustard bottle game. You know, and again, I know Tennessee people will disagree. Their guy was short of the line of the game. And I I thought that in live action. Then when they reviewed it, there was nothing there to overturn it. And so Tennessee loses 31-26. Tennessee probably should have won the ball game. But Ole Miss does. And it's a tough place to go in a Neyland Stadium and win. They get – LSU gets uh, Eli Manning Day. And Ole Miss gets them by a couple touchdowns. And then, of course, they go to Auburn to lose the ball game. A a, a real – 
bump in the road, I guess you could say. Ole Miss should have won that game. They really should have. Bo Nix gave them a lot of trouble. They beat Liberty. They beat A&M, which was probably the biggest surprise to me on their schedule. I thought that Texas A&M would be able to run all over them with that poor rush defense, but they weren't. And then Vandy hangs in there for a little bit, makes a game of it, but Ole Miss wins, and then they win the Egg Bowl and uh, win their bowl game, excuse me, lose their bowl game to Baylor. And I think you probably see that as a harbinger of things to come. What did that team look like without Matt Corral under center? They did not look good. Uh, so let's look at this year. You know, this is what I suspect, and I'm sure I'll get some messages about it. That's okay. I don't care. Uh, they get they open with Troy. That's a win. Central Arkansas, that's a win. They're at Georgia Tech. That's a bit of a toss-up, but I think Ole Miss will be able to out-talent them. Jeff Collins, I guess, could get them, but I've got Ole Miss winning that game. Then they're going to get Tulsa. They'll win that one. The Kentucky game is a toss-up, and then Vanderbilt. I could see Kentucky winning that game. I could. I do think that's a real toss-up and an important game. But, you know, Ole Miss should be able to get out of the gate really, really strong, and they should be 5-0 and when they get ready. Or, excuse me, 4-0 and when they host Kentucky. I th- you know, that's a toss-up when they'll beat Vanderbilt. They'll beat Auburn. I've got them losing at LSU, though. Going on the road at LSU, and then the next week they're at A&M, and then they host Alabama and then travel to Arkansas. I think they're going to lose all four of those games, and I think we're going to see a pretty defeated Ole Miss team when we show up uh, there for Thanksgiving in Oxford. So I've got Ole Miss opening up the year, you know, six and one, and then losing out. You say, Steve, that's crazy. I don't think so. I think if you look at the numbers here, you know, you've got to go and play in three very hostile environments against teams that are as talented or more talented than you. And in the middle of that, you get Alabama and then Mississippi State. And, of course, Mike Leach fully appreciates the fact that this is a game they need to win. So I've got Ole Miss going 6-6 six and six and 2-6 and six in the league. Could be a 7-5 and five if they beat Kentucky and then 3-6, and six, but I still have them 6th. I have a tie for 4th place, but the team that I think loses that tiebreaker is the University of Arkansas. I think Arkansas takes a little bit of a step back this year. Now, this is a team, too, that, you know, they had a lot of transfers, too, but they had a ton of transfers in. So it'll be interesting to kind of see how that all unfolds. And, you know, Sam Pittman has proved a lot of people wrong. Uh, I think 8-4 is probably a good year, considering, you know, the fact that this league, I think, is going to be a little bit better this year. But, uh, you know, when you look back, you know, at last year, there were some games they won they probably shouldn't have. You know, they beat Rice handily, they, and then they destroyed Texas, which is a huge surprise. Not that they won, but the way they beat them, 40-21. They beat Georgia Southern 3-0. And then they take down A&M, number seven A&M in Arlington. And everybody thought, well, these guys are for real. And then they go to Athens and get absolutely destroyed. That game was over five minutes in. Then they lose that nail-biter to Ole Miss. Auburn goes into Fayetteville and gets them. They beat Pine Bluff. Then they get us 31-28 if we're able to make a, make a kick here. It's a different ball game. Then they go and win at LSU, 16-13. Of course, at that point, the Ed Orton era was kind of winding down. But uh, that's, again, a game that LSU should have won, but Arkansas found a way to do it. And then they're very competitive against Alabama. That was a surprise. They mashed Missouri pretty good. They beat Penn State in the ballgame. But, again, I think they take a step back. They were a veteran team last year. They lost a lot to graduation. They lost a lot um, in the transfer portal. That whole secondary is completely different. This year they open up with Cincinnati. That is a very intriguing ball game. You know, Fickle and those guys done a great job amassing some talent there. I still think going into Fable is tough. And I don't know if the Bearcats can pull it off. You know, last year they were with the best G5 team in the country. So will there be a little bit of a letdown? Those guys will expect to win and kind of legitimize themselves. So it's a bit of a toss-up. But I've got Arkansas winning. Then they get South Carolina coming in. I've got Arkansas winning that one too. Then Missouri State comes in. I, of course, that's a win. So I, I think Arkansas gets out to a 3-0 and o start. They play A&M again in Arlington, and I think Jimbo and those guys are just more talented. I think that A&M will get them this year. Then they get a week off. Excuse me. They don't get a week off. Uh, the next week, they play Alabama and then us. And so I kind of like the fact that Mississippi State gets them after a pretty brutal stretch there. You know, it's not a trap game in some respects, but they, you know, let's say they lose to A&M and then get hammered by Alabama. 
and you know the physical toll the Crimson Tide takes on you, and then you have to travel to Starkville. I like the way the game is positioned for us on the schedule, and I think that's really the difference between us and Arkansas. I think we beat Arkansas. And then they'll go to BYU. I think they win there. I think they win at Auburn. I think they win against Liberty, and then they get LSU. I'm actually going to take LSU to win this game. I think LSU will actually take a step forward this year. Ole Miss goes to Arkansas. I've got Arkansas winning that game, and then Arkansas winning at Missouri. So I've got them going eight and four, eight and four on the year, um, because I do think they'll beat Cincinnati. So they'll win the four non-conference and then split uh, their four conference games, picking up wins against Ole Miss, uh, Missouri, Auburn, and uh, South Carolina. So eight and four, four and four in the league, which means I also think Mississippi State is four and four in the league. I think Mississippi State is looking at eight and four record and said, but Steve, the schedule's more difficult. And it is. You know, but State should have been eight and four last year. You know, and the schedule last year, you know, you, you basically trade Vandy for, for Georgia. But, you know, how many games last year should we have won? You could make an argument, you know what, you nearly lost Louisiana Tech, you nearly lost Auburn. And, and all of that is absolutely true. So let's take a quick look at the Mississippi State schedule uh, and kind of run this down for it. And again, I think State's eight and four this year. I think we take another step forward. Uh, when you look at last year's numbers, and we, you all have gone over this schedule ad nauseum about what could have been. You know, we had the big comeback to beat Louisiana Tech. Will did not have a good game, had a really good fourth quarter, though. And then we, we settled down and we beat NC State. That's a quality win. That's a quality team. And then we lose in controversial fashion at Memphis. But at the end of the day, that's on us. And you say, well, it shouldn't have come down to that play, but it did. You know what? We had opportunities to put that game away. And I think if we score right there before the half, they probably quit. But we didn't, and we lose 31-29. She just shouldn't have happened. Special teams absolutely kills us. We lose to LSU 28-25. And to be honest with you guys, I think at this point LSU was still playing well. We're the last team that really got LSU at their best. LSU got really beat up in this ball game, and it cost them the rest of the year. Just when people are ready to give up on state, we're 2-2. Two two. We go down to A&M, we win that ball game. And we knew going into last year that we didn't have a lot of margin for error. We knew getting ball eligibility was going to be tough. That was a huge win for State. And then we go to Alabama, we play Alabama here, we get smashed. Then we go to Vanderbilt and smash those guys. Now you're three and three, and you start thinking, okay, we got to find a way to piece this thing together. Got to find a way to get three down the stretch. What we do, we actually do. And, um, you know, again, at this point, after the Vanderbilt game, you've already got four. So you just find a way to get a couple to get ball eligible, and you had Tennessee State in your back pocket. We go on, a, to, on the road to Arkansas, which they said themselves was their Super Bowl, and we didn't play exceptionally well. Still played well enough to win, just didn't execute in a special teams game, and it cost us. We lose 31-28. That's the one that really, to me, still sticks in the crawl. The Memphis game sucked, but this is one here. Where we didn't get beat on some controversial play. We got beat because we couldn't get a stop. Will Rogers takes us down and gives us the lead, and then we blow it. We blow it. Auburn, of course, you know, a lot of people ready to get up on the Bulldogs, and we go to Auburn at the time. They were still playing pretty good football and have the biggest comeback in school history. And then at this point now, you're, you know, you're bowl eligible, and you're playing for bowl positioning. We get Tennessee State the next week, blow them guys out 55-10, then we lose to Ole Miss, and Ole Miss was a better team than us. Now, we can talk about the three touchdown passes we dropped on one drive. But Matt Corral beat us, guys. Simple as that. Matt Corral beat us. And then we lose the ball game in very embarrassing fashion. And, you know, there are a lot, we could have easily just said, you know what, we're not going to play. I mean, we're missing so many guys on defense. But uh, I think that, that, that goes against who Mike Leach is. And I think in some respects goes against what Mississippi State is and what we stand for. So Mississippi State plays the ball game. We lose. And it was awful, absolutely awful. And I've read some people, all oh, these guys quit. I don't know that we got quit. I think, I think we got beat in a submission because of the fact we didn't have any depth. All right, looking at this year's schedule, and again, I, I've got us 8-4. and four. I've got us beating Memphis handily. I, I think that is one that we will, uh, we will be ready to go. You remember we gifted them a touchdown early in that ball game? It's like we let those guys hang around, and we still overcame that and still had a chance to have control and put it away. I, I, I don't think there will be any question we'll be ready to go for them. We go to Arizona. That's an Arizona team that um, still kind of kind of get a sense of themselves. I, I actually have us winning out there. I think we'll win that game at Arizona. I just don't think they're going to have the depth in the secondary to handle the air raid. We just got to play some pretty good defense there. 
Uh, we, we go to LSU. That, to me, that's always a loss. I know we won down, down there back in 2020. That's a loss to me. And I think this LSU team is actually going to be much better this year. Uh, we'll get Bowling Green. So that makes day three and one as A&M comes to town. And that's a real toss-up there. I like this A&M team. They've got some question marks. That's a bit of a toss-up. But I'm going to pick A&M to win. I think A&M will be one of these teams, too, that will be uh, you're pretty excited about coming to Starkville after what happened last year. Uh, then we get Arkansas. And I think we can get Arkansas here. Then we go to Kentucky. That's a winnable game for us, but again, a bit of a toss-up. Going to Tuscaloosa, there's no point in us commenting on that. And then uh, Auburn comes here. I think we beat Auburn, and then we lose to Georgia, take down East Tennessee State, and yes, I'm calling it, we're winning the Egg Bowl. Uh, so 8-4, and four, we win the four non-conference games, and we beat Ole Miss, we beat Auburn, uh, we beat Arkansas, and uh, I think we'll probably get Kentucky too. So – uh, I think seven and five is the is the floor. I think eight and four is probably the over under. And if we can pull an upset somewhere, maybe you get to nine and three. Not expecting that though. I, I think Georgia and Alabama to me look like sheer losses, and it's always so difficult to go into LSU and play. Uh, but I've got us eight and four winning the tiebreaker over Arkansas because we win the head to head with those guys. All right, number three in the SEC West, in my opinion, at this point. And again, things may change once we see you know guys get injured. You know, sometimes it happens. Guys get injured, guys transfer out. You know, you never know what teams are going to look like when you play them. But uh, I, I think this LSU team with Brian Kelly with a more simplified offense and with a little something to prove. Yes, there are a lot of question marks on this team. I don't think there's any question. Uh, but I think they will be better. I don't think they truly contend for the West this year, but I do think they will take a step forward from last year. Uh, so let's take a quick look at what kind of how last year went for those guys. Six and seven. And you remember how crazy it was there at the end. You know, they lost the opening game at UCLA, and it was not good. It was not a pretty game. They destroyed McNeese State. Central Michigan moved the football against them, but just didn't have the athletes. LSU wins 49-21. They come here and beat us 28-25. And, again, we had some defensive lapses and some special teams miscues, and we had a big interception that Will Rogers threw that we were driving down, and Will kind of laid the ball up for grabs and pulled too much under, under it, and they pick it off. But they win. Then they lose to Auburn. They go to Kentucky and get absolutely destroyed, 42-21. I, I did not expect that to happen. Did not expect that to happen. Uh, then they respond and uh, just destroy Florida. Just ran all over them, set a school record for rushing in the game. They lose at Ole Miss. Was hoping they'd win. They didn't. And then they get in there and really compete well against Alabama, and Alabama wins 20-14. And then they lose to Arkansas in, um, in overtime. They bounce back to beat Louisiana Monroe in very lackluster fashion, 27-14. And then they get A&M to get ball eligible. And then they basically have nobody left. Guys opt out, enter the draft, and uh, didn't have a quarterback left. But they still went and played the game. So I commend LSU, much like Mississippi State. They had every reason to cancel the game. They did, and they went and played. They got destroyed, but they played the game. So – Six and seven, and then you begin to look at this year. Right out of the gate, they get Florida State. So we're going to find out pretty quick here. That's going to be in New Orleans, be a wild crowd. Should be a really good ball game. We'll see. You know, this is two teams and some question marks, but uh, I think Florida State will get them. I know it'll be in New Orleans, but I think Florida State could get them. Then they get Southern the next week. Then they get Mississippi State at home. Then they get New Mexico. So there's a three-game stretch that they should win all those games. So should be no worse than three and one when they get ready to go to Auburn. And, again, I'm not a big fan of Auburn at all. I think LSU wins that one. Tennessee goes into to Tiger Stadium. Uh, I think, again, this is probably a very difficult matchup for both teams. It'll be a real toss-up. It's tough to win in Tiger Stadium. The next week they go to Florida, I think that's a loss. I think Florida has the pieces to be a much better team this year. Uh, And I think that Billy Napier will kind of have it out for LSU. I think they'll be ready to go for that. The next week they get Ole Miss in Tiger Stadium. They get Alabama. That's a loss. Then they got to go to Fayetteville. I think LSU wins that one. Then they get UAB and then at A&M. I've got A&M winning that game. I think A&M is going to have still a lot to play for trying to probably find a way into playoffs. So I've got LSU going 9-3 and three overall and 5-3 and three in the league. 
Number two for me is A&M. Uh, I think this A&M team, you know, last year I think they were a quarterback away from really doing something special. And maybe they found it, you know, with Max Johnson. You know, we'll see. And, and people talk about the number one recruiting class. What well, takes a while for those guys to kind of get going. Um, but, yeah, they're recruiting at a high level. There's no question about it. And uh, also, you know, got a couple of nice transfers to go with it. But uh, when you look at this schedule from last year, and that's the thing, it's like, okay, they finally get over the hump and beat Alabama, but lose to both Mississippi schools and Arkansas in the same year. But they opened up in pretty good shape, right? They beat Kent State. They struggled against Colorado and then lost the quarterback for the year. They bounced back to beat New Mexico. Uh, so 3-0 and to start, but uh, quarterback issues, to say the least. Those quarterback issues emerged – the next two weeks, they lose, at Ar- lose to Arkansas at uh, Arlington and then lose to Mississippi State. Uh, Calzada just, you know, just couldn't put it together. Well, a week later, he dies, and they beat Alabama. Kid played the game of his life. They went 41-38, had a big field goal late to win it. Then they beat Mizzou, and then they beat South Carolina and, and won those games handily. Beat Auburn handily. So, they're like, they're all of a sudden, they've, they've gotten over the hump. I didn't think they'd lose again the rest of the year. But they did. So after you beat Auburn, then you, you go to uh, Oxford and Ole Miss, a great job defensively in this ball game. Really did a great job. Kind of bottled up Spiller, forced Calzada to win the game, and he couldn't do it. 29-19 winners for Ole Miss. And if I remember correctly, Ole Miss had a pick six in that ball game to kind of put some separation between them and the Aggies. They destroy Prairie View and then lose to LSU. So, as great as that Alabama, Alabama moment was, this is a pretty substandard season. It's 8-4. and four. I think they're better this year. And I think part of that is I think the league is probably – there's a little more parity in the league this year. So, they'll open up with Sam Houston State, big win, Appalachian State win. That Miami game in Kyle Field, that'll be awfully interesting. Awfully interesting to see what happens there. Uh, I still think that A&M will find a way to win the game. And then they get Arkansas at Arlington, and then they come here. So they could be 4-0 and coming here. And, again, I like the fact this A&M game for us is sandwiched in there perfectly. They lost to Arkansas last year in Arlington. They play them the week before they play us. And this is a six-game stretch here without a bye date. No open date for them. So they're going to play six consecutive weeks. We get them week five of that stretch. And then the next week they're at Alabama. After what we've seen happen between these two teams in the offseason, I could certainly see that being a bit of a trap game for them. And so I, I think we have a chance to get that one. I really do. I think we have a chance. I like where it's positioned. We'll see how things go. Then they get their bye date after open date after Alabama. So six straight weeks. And that's Miami, Arkansas, and then a road trip to Mississippi State and a road trip to Alabama. That is a difficult stretch. That four-game stretch will define the A&M season. I think they find a way to uh, to get it done. Um, and then they get South Carolina. Ole Miss goes to Kyle Field. They get Florida at Kyle Field. They go to Auburn. They get UMass at LSU. And so I actually have the Aggies going 10-2. and two. I think that Alabama will absolutely get them. And then, uh, you know, maybe we do. How about that? For the, for the second year in a row. So th- that's how I'm picking it. I think we get them, and I think Alabama gets them. Miami may get them too, but that won't impact the SEC standings. And so that leaves us, of course, with Alabama. You got the Heisman Trophy winner back. You got just the parade of all Americans. <laughs> I've got Alabama going undefeated. Now, you look at last year, of course, it was uh, even by Alabama standards, it wasn't a great year. I mean, it really wasn't. I mean, it's like we talked about this is a vulnerable Alabama team, and it was, and they still played for a NAFL championship. Let that sink in for a second. It wasn't a great Alabama defense. It was an, an Alabama offense that was still really good, but there were times – that they were very inconsistent. They blow out Miami. They blow out Mercer. They sneak by Florida. Dan Mullen nearly got them, right? Dan's probably will take a job at some point that he didn't have to play Alabama. They blow out Southern Miss. They blow out Ole Miss, and then they lose to A&M. And, and everybody had left A&M dead and buried at that point. They blow us out. 
Uh, blow out Tennessee. The game was competitive for about a half, and then Alabama puts them away. They sneak by LSU at home. They blow out New Mexico State. They sneak by Arkansas at home, and then they went in four overtimes at Auburn. So, you know, three of those last four ball games kind of showed that Alabama was fading a little bit. Just when you thought it was over, they absolutely crushed Georgia in the SEC championship game, 41-24. They win the Cotton Bowl and destroyed Cincinnati, and then they lose to Georgia in the NFL Championship game. So 13-2 and two on the year, and you say, but Steve, what a great year. You know, I think Nick Saban would probably tell you that wasn't one of his better teams, and they still played for an NFL Championship. Says a lot about Nick Saban. But, again, I think they're undefeated this year and right back in the playoff. You know, barring a major injury, I just, you know – the depth that they have available to them is just remarkable. And so that's your SEC West preview. Again, I've got State 8-4, and 4-4 four, four and four in the league. Uh, decent ball game somewhere. And I think really what we want to see is a step forward. Can we upset somebody? Sure we can. Could we lose somebody we shouldn't? We absolutely could. And that's kind of been a Mike Leach experience, right? So, you know, we'll see what happens. You know, Alabama is the one team we just hadn't been competitive against uh, in recent years. You know, I guess our best chance is back in 18. But um, – or 17, excuse me. But uh, the reality of it is, is that, you know, everybody else on the schedule you look at, you got a shot. I think Georgia's a sure loss too. But, you know, we went down there and played them a couple of years ago and played them within a play a win in a ball game. And so I don't think we'll be intimidated by any stretch. But that's my SEC West preview. We'll look at the East uh, on Monday. And then we'll begin to get a little more in-depth with our previews about, you know, the league and our, our future opponents. Let's take some time now to thank our friends at Portico. Great people. I love everybody involved with that group. Uh, Brooks Bryan, longtime friend, not just a friend of mine, a friend of you, a friend of the program, a friend of Starkville, part of a great group of developers bringing this wonderful residential development to Starkville. If I was moving to Starkville now, it's where I'd move. It's about location, location, location. 1.1 miles away from the Mississippi State campus, easy access to 82 and 12. And, of course, you just shoot right around the Walmart there on 82, get 25, don't have to file that traffic. It's great. It's so incredibly positioned to be close to all the things that you love about Starkville. It's wonderful. You can start with a two-bedroom, two-bath home, go all the way up to a three-bedroom, four-bedroom, four-bath home. And here's the deal, too. Phase one completely sold out. Phase two, I already got some houses under construction. A couple of them are sold, but they're building some to sell. And then there's some other lots that are available, too. Maybe if you want to do a custom build, they can help you with that, too. Great people involved with this project. You'll be glad that you've done it. You've always wanted to have a place in Starkville. Maybe it's your permanent residence. Maybe it's your retirement home. Maybe it's your second home. It'd be nice to have that, wouldn't it? Give Brooks Bryan a call today. He'll give you more information. 601-416-8075. Again, that's 601-416-8075. Make Portico your next move. All right. In the few minutes we still have left together, Let's talk a little bit about uh, baseball transfer stuff. So it is still very early in this process. And uh, we've talked a little bit about, you know, the portal. They have until July 1st. And so, you know, you remember last year we were in Omaha. There were guys who were having the transfer to go in the portal. And people were like, what are we doing? Well, there's a deadline. And so we'll have to work through that too. But as teams get eliminated from the NCAA tournament, you're going to have guys go in the portal. Now, I have heard through the grapevine outside of Mississippi State, through some of our contacts in the college baseball and Major League Baseball world, that there are some guys that are still playing that Mississippi State will certainly have an interest in. And, you know, usually how this thing works is, uh, you know, once guys hit the portal, everybody can contact them, which kind of reminds me of uh, a from from Tulane. You know, like I've been inundated with people that, apparently are talking to people that I'm not, and they're like, oh, well, this kid's going to come to Mississippi State. I hope he does. That guy can really swing it. He killed us. He absolutely did. But I can tell you Mississippi State's first contact with him was the day he went in the portal. That's the truth. He did not go into the portal because he already had some deal in place at Mississippi State. That's just not accurate. It's just not. Now, I want the guy to wear maroon and white. I'd love for him to be there for us. I'm excited about the possibility. But that process is still really beginning. He just left New Orleans. He's moved to Florida, kind of fielding some offers now, kind of figuring this thing out. And of course, he's got a few weeks to figure it out. Doesn't have to make a decision today. 
But, uh, you know, some people were like, oh, he's going to commit any day now. And I, that's just not the information that I have. And I trust my sources immensely when it comes to this. Uh, Chase Englehart, another Tulane player, went into the portal yesterday. Uh, believe we broke that news. Now, he's a guy, too, had, had a really good series against Mississippi State last year. He's had a couple of really good games against State. He battled a thumb injury this year. Is primarily a second baseman, could be an, an, a shortstop. When you think about bringing Nate Chester in and bringing Lane Forsyth back, you know, how it, attractive does that make Mississippi State? It's like, okay, the second baseman job is wide open, and Davis Mesh has left. You know, Mesh is a guy, too, that uh, you expected to compete there. But now you brought Chester in. So if you're Chase Engelhardt, are you thinking, okay, well, I need to go somewhere where it's wide open. But this guy was a freshman All-American. I can't imagine that he would be intimidated by a guy coming in from the JUCO ranks, even though he was a former SEC player there in Nate Chester. But does, what, what fits Mississippi State? And people forget, too, and there's a lot of people that don't understand, too, we have a huge class coming in. So it's not as simple as, okay, well, we, we'll just go sign 10 guys out of the portal. You don't have room for 10 guys. You don't. We'll make room. We, we've already made a lot of room. And so where's that room going to come from? You know, I'm, I'm told on good authority we're done with transfer outs for now. That's not to say that somebody won't get back from Summer League Baseball and say, Coach, I think I'm going to do this. You never rule that possibility out. But, uh, you know, based on what I've heard from reputable sources, you know, we're done with transfer outs. Now it's about transfer ends. We discussed some of that on Wednesday's show. But we'll start getting some good news here. But there are a lot of players out there that will be targeted from Mississippi State that are not in the portal yet. You know, basically you kind of divide it up. Okay, here's who's in the portal. There's who, here's who we think or we're hearing may go in the portal. And these are some guys we'd love to go in the portal, right? I mean, that's kind of how you break it all up. And so you, you look at it, and there's, you know, there's a ton of players in the portal right now. But some of the best players that are going to be in the portal are still playing baseball right now. You know, we've talked recently about Guy Lipscomb from, uh, from Belmont, originally from Tupelo, Mississippi. Lots of Mississippi State connections with him. Grandfather at one time was uh, part owner of one of the boxes at Davis Wade Stadium. I believe his dad came to Mississippi State. Uh, parents broke up, and then uh, he moved to the Nashville, Tennessee area. Now he's at Belmont. But uh, this is a guy that has had an incredible year, an Ohio Valley Conference uh, player of the year, or freshman of the year. I can't remember the exact award, but uh, this is a guy that has done it at a Division I level. Uh, stole a bunch of bases, too. Center fielder. A guy that's got a lot of connections to our program. Makes a lot of sense. But, you know, he hadn't gone in the portal yet unless he's gone in today. And so that's the thing. That you, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of smoke out there you get. You know, we, we have friends that are cross-checkers. We have friends that are pro scouts. And, you know, they hear a lot of stuff before we do because a lot of these players in college baseball already have agents. And so they're kind of putting it out that he's going to the portal. We're trying to find an opportunity in the Power Five. You know, we, we have people we talk to. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. And the risk you run, too, is if you get too involved with a guy now and then he gets drafted in the first ten rounds uh, in July and he signs, what are you left with? Well, nothing. Now all of a sudden i got to go mine the portal again for a guy that's not nearly as the guy that I passed on to take the guy that signed. There's a lot to it. A lot of players out there, too, that, um, you know, again, that are still playing baseball that uh, are looking for other opportunities. So there's a lot of layers to every bit of this. But, uh, again, State, a, a good week. We picked up Nate Chester on Sunday, a junior college transfer, and then we picked up Gartman from Memphis out of the portal early this week. And so I suspect next week we could see a little more movement in that respect. And, again, now it's kind of the good news portion of, of – of the transfer process because you, you kind of got your transfer outs done. Now it's about adding players. And we're going to have full coverage of that over at jeanspage.com. Uh, we're doing our best to cover better than anybody. And it's a commitment to us. It's a passion for us. And like all of you, you know, we're eager to get to know the new pieces. And at the end of the day, too, and I remind you of this, and, and I've said it on the show several times, and I mean it's in no disrespect to anybody. It's not the, it's not the Boy Scouts. It's not the Boy Scouts. Because the same people that are like, oh, I don't understand why this guy's leaving. It'll be the same guy that's once Chris Lamont is fired next year if we don't win. Right? And so I think sometimes the best thing to do is to let the coach coach. 
you know, the coach works with the guys every day. The coach understands what's out there. You know, the coach understands what it takes to win. Chris Monos is a guy that's never had a losing season as a college player or coach until this year. He has won everywhere he's been at every level. Chris knows what it takes to win. I've talked to some of your other coaches in recent days, too, and they'll, they'll just tell you. They said, hey, you know, we've learned how thin the margin is between winning and losing. You know, and we had some guys, and I got criticized for it, but I said it on the show. You know, we had a lot of kids at Mississippi State that weren't good enough to play at Mississippi State. Doesn't mean you're not good people. Doesn't mean they weren't great students. It doesn't mean they caused problems. But to compete at the level that we need to compete at, you know, we have to have the best of the best. And sometimes you commit a guy in the eighth and ninth grade, he didn't develop the way that you hope. So the thing that I have learned from the couple guys that we have added so far is these guys have some dog in them. These guys have, you know what, I'm playing at Mississippi State. I understand the expectations that go along with that. There are some people that get here and feel like they've made it. I think these guys get here and realize that, in some respects, we're kind of making them. I had a high school umpire that posted on the jeanspage.com message boards and said that he, when Nate Chester was a high school player, he umpired several games so the kids can fit in perfect. It's exactly what we need. Talking to some people, you know, when this Nate Chester thing, commitment thing happened, you know, getting some messages from some people connected with him, this is the, the dream for him, is to go play at a college baseball blue blood. And I've been told nobody's going to outwork him. And I've been told that he is kind of that irritating middle infielder, a guy that's always bouncing around out there, and, you know, bobbing in and out back and forth, holding people accountable and making them think they shouldn't get a big lead, and that he's an ultra competitor. I've heard the same thing about Gardman. You know, that's the thing, too. That I, when I get to hear those things, and like what I hear about Garvin is he can be whatever we want him to be. He can be a weekend starter. He can be a midweek starter. He can be a middle relief guy. He can be whatever we need him to be. And if somebody else told me, if that guy ends up being a midweek starter for us, then we have done exceptionally well in the portal because he's good enough to start on the weekends for us. But, again, let's just kind of see how the roster fills out before we start assigning pat, uh, pitching responsibilities, right? I'm excited about what is to come. But uh, I'm eager to learn about the new pieces and kind of see where they all fit. And, again, there's a lot of names out there, and there's even more to come. But uh, we'll stay on top of it as best we can. Uh, we've got basically, you know, three, four people working on it right now, working sources on a daily basis, just trying to get some information for you guys. And we share that over at jeanspage.com. And, of course, uh, some of it here on the Boneyard. All right, that's it for today. Be sure and go and uh, check us out It's at uh, – dogpilethebook.com, and you get personalized copies of all my sports books there. It's Alpha Dog, Stark Villains, and Flim Flam. Get Blooms of Oleander. You can get it on a Kindle. You can get it on an, as an ebook. You can uh, order it uh, through barnesandnoble.com. You can order it through your local bookstore. You can order it through Amazon. We'd encourage you to do so. And then Stark Villains gear, always available at starkvillains.com. I love those shirts, too. I really do. That's it for today. We'll see you next time. Until then, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live. Introducing Under Armour's Infinity High Sports Bra. Its ergonomic design is molded to support the natural movement of your body. With cord out padding, the better breathability eliminates extra bulk without sacrificing support. And quick dry padding is Under Armour's fastest drying padding yet. When you're lifting heavy, running fast, and pushing yourself further than ever before, you need a bra that will help you go that extra mile and make you feel your best. Shop the Infinity High Sports Bra now at UA.com.